This is a production of Cornell University. Yeah, let's get started. Uh, welcome everyone to episode six of the Cornell Turf Show, uh, season four, right? We've been doing this our fourth year now. Um, our guest today is Dr. Aaron Patton from Purdue. Uh, a Purdue theme here, Frank. We had uh, Kale Bigelow on a couple of weeks ago, and now we're getting Aaron on here. Uh, looking, just looking Aaron's uh, recent research up, Frank, we've got a lot of interesting things Aaron's been working on. So I don't know what we'll get to today, but uh, it will surely be an interesting conversation. Uh, Frank, as always, I'll pass it over to you uh, and you can get us started today with some of your uh, most recent thoughts. Let's go here. I think I got, I think I got, I, listen, this is getting to be my uh, favorite thing of all the things that I do. And I'm really happy to have wonderful professionals that are willing to give their time. But Carl, you know, as we always get started, uh, we, you know, we try to get people thinking about things other than turf. Well, there's obviously masters if you're in the golf business, but if you're in the baseball business, which I love baseball, um, the pace of these games is making me very happy. I don't need to watch people adjust their uh, equipment for 35 minutes to get them to appreciate, uh, you know, watching a baseball game. So Carl, I want to start out by saying, you know, this has been a big advancement uh, and actually a big change in thinking uh, about the way we think about baseball. And I know you've got something that we don't intuitively think about uh, when we're thinking about sports and, and that is your rant for today on rolling. Hmm. Yeah. So, so Frank, we talk a lot about rolling in, in the, in the golf course sense, right on putting greens. And there's even some research on fairway rolling, uh, obviously at the elite level, whether we're watching the masters or any other PGA tour tournament, right. Those greens are getting rolled quite often. And we understand the, the benefits of that in a golf course sense. Uh, I was sort of interested, Hey, you know, what sort of research is there in the sports field sense? And on our safe sports field website, we talk a little bit about rolling, you know, the benefits there, obviously you smooth the surface, you make it more even. Uh, so you get better ball roll, more predictability. The coaches and the athletes love that. Uh, you can firm up a surface that's maybe a little bit too wet. Uh, and of course the speed, right? And that's the thing the coaches will always talk about. Hey, I want to see that ball rolling out uh, nice and true. Uh, but we also make a, a, a nod to that. You have to sort of do this thoughtfully, right? Especially in the saturated soil environment, right? Avoid rolling uh, that, that might, uh, you know, disrupt the soil structure. Uh, but I sort of looked up, uh, you know, turf grass information file is a great thing for people to to look up. There's a bunch of abstracts, right? These aren't things that that maybe make it all the way to, to being published, but there's some really cool data in listening to these abstracts. So this is one on lightweight rolling uh, from Michigan State. Of course, Tom Nikolai is involved uh, in this. Basically, there were three treatments in an athletic field. Uh, no rolling three times per week and five times per week. Uh, so that five times per week is probably a pretty high rate of rolling for, for those in the athletic fields. Predictably, right, you see increases in the ball roll distance, just like on a putting green, we have a stint meter, there's a device where you roll a ball off, see how far it travels. Uh, they saw significant increases in that five times per week rolling frequency of the increased ball roll distance somewhere, you know, it depends on the rating day, a meter to a meter and a half, right, five or six feet at, at the most, maybe not so much at the three times rolling frequency. So interesting that uh, you really need to roll a lot to get those benefits. Uh, similar thing you saw with the firmness, which I didn't show the data on here. Uh, but there's these other benefits that you might get uh, out of rolling athletic fields. Broadleaf weed counts. Um, so you can see here for those watching uh, on the left, you could see a higher number of, of broadleaf weeds per plot than the, the either of the rolling treatments. Uh, they didn't come up with statistical significance on this. Uh, and maybe that's that's maybe another rant for me, Frank, is uh, statistical significance versus practical significance, right? Does that make a difference? So they weren't really able to say, hey, there was a st statistical decrease in broadleaf weeds due to rolling. But Frank, you and I have seen this out in the field and we've done some testing on our turf plots where rolling absolutely sort of gets the weeds out of there. And there's this beautiful picture I took, I think it's two Aprils ago now of the Botanic Gardens, um, yeah. for the, the, the Botanic Garden Visitor Center at Cornell. And you can see where all the vehicles drive. Uh, there's no dandelions, right? And you can see in the peripheral areas where there's no vehicle traffic, Lots of dandelions. Frank, you saw this with Chris Sitko's work with crabgrass, controlling crabgrass with high rolling frequencies out of the vineyard. Uh, we've seen it at our, our bluegrass lane plots where we rolled a fairway constantly. And a year after, uh, we even saw uh, no crabgrass in those plots. So, you know, maybe there's a lot of other stuff that we get out of rolling in athletic fields. Uh, and and when they when they were making their conclusions here in this study, they didn't see any detrimental effects. So I think as long as, as we avoid the real saturated conditions, you know, I'm, I'm a fan of rolling more, uh, whether it's golf courses or, or sports fields. I, I like the idea of rolling, 
really as much as you can because it's it's hard to push it to the limit where I think you see uh, maybe some of those traffic or compaction issues. Right. Okay, Carl, this is brilliant because of all the things we could chat with Aaron about with regard to sports fields and the many things he uh, gets involved in, this is one that didn't come to mind to me. But Aaron, I'd love to get your two cents on this. As Carl said, we see this consistently. I've also seen it with clover and ground ivy and other plants. Now, I know Sorokin's done some traffic tolerance things on this, but there is a fine line. I, you know, obviously, we've always sort of said a thick, dense turf keeps the weeds out. I'll say some of this turf sometimes gets a little thin itself, but the weeds still don't grow. So I'd love to hear your speculation on this because of the many things we're going to get to that you had studied. This does not appear to be one that you have studied yet, or if you have, I haven't found it yet. What do you think? Yeah, so Tom, uh, Nikolai, and I have talked about this topic and, and even consider, consider doing some research on it in the past. Um, yeah, certainly just weeds are not as traffic tolerant as turf. And you had mentioned some work out of Tennessee that shows that. Um, and obviously just pictures like this uh, demonstrate that. Now we have to be careful that, that we're, we're looking, I, I don't doubt your findings, uh, but we have to be careful there's not just maybe some delayed flowering caused by traffic or some mm -hmm. other thing, right? So we'd have to obviously go on site and look look mm -hmm. down on the ground and mm -hmm. make sure we don't just find dandelions lines that are further further back developmentally. But I, I agree that the, the grasses are more traffic tolerant than the weeds. And so having a little traffic or a little rolling can help get rid of them. I guess what's um, what's uh, maybe stopped me from doing research on on it in the past is just a practicality of adding rolling as a management practice from a labor standpoint, uh, just to accomplish some weed control. Um, but we know that there are certain sites where they can't use herbicides, uh, but maybe they do have uh, you know enough labor budget that they could implement other cultural practices. Mm -hmm. So so this could be something that they could do. And so what we would have to do is then figure out, okay, well how often would I actually have to roll these sites uh, to get that weed control them after? And, and Carl referenced, you know, one one study that had, had attempted to answer some of those questions. So, so because because Watson uh, in the fifties uh, had something in the green section record where he looked at compaction effects on crabgrass germination. Because as Carl mentioned, Aaron, we've actually seen some persistent uh, crabgrass suppression in the tire tracks a year or two year and two years after we initially imposed the treatment and the turf is really at uh, full cover but uh and i haven't looked at the soils and played around but there was this suggestion that potentially compacted soils are not conducive to germinating which also is a bit counterintuitive because i always thought that's where i saw goose grass more and maybe goose grass is more tolerant of compacted soils than crabgrass. But I think any study of this, I thought you were going to say the practicality of actually studying the weed seed bank, that's got its own problems. Yeah. Uh, in addition to the practicality to adding rolling. Now, we had uh, Dr. Askew on yesterday. It's Weed Science Week here on the Turf Show. And uh, he's doing that crazy stuff with the heating and the cooling. And then he puts a plate or a block on it, right? Some form of pressure. Is there something in weed science I'm not familiar with, with pressure that is uh, adding to the stress on a plant? Because I'm thinking that's obviously what rolling is doing to the weight and pressure uh, on the plant. And he's always combining it with, the, you know, either a cryogenic treatment or a thermal treatment uh, when he does it. I'm just wondering what you guys, what, what if there's anything about, you know, pressing on a weed or just just straight up traffic columns um yeah i'm not sure i mean certainly there's something going on there that you know these other plants are just less traffic tolerant than the, than the grasses right so there's something to their leaf architecture or their structural components mm -hmm. that are different that's not allowing them to yeah uh, uh to be as as elastic or to be as rigid or to to be able to recover maybe as well uh you know from that damage um i gotta think that having that uh that that crown right down there near the soil surface is is very helpful for these turf grasses to to handle that traffic tolerance and and many of our weeds may not have 
uh, you know, may have that air, meristem up a little bit higher or it may be damaged, um, you know, by the traffic more so than the crown of the turf grass plant is. But that would certainly be something that, that we need some more study. This is great because Tom needs something to do in retirement. <laughs> All right. So listen, let me just do a little weather here. And it looks like, you know, it's weird. We have these warm winters and we expect the season like it teased us back in late February. And, and honestly, now we'd say it's, it's 10 days behind normal. Uh, interestingly, uh, normal is the 30 year normal and almost 20 days behind where we were even last year. It just seems like these springs are having a harder and harder time uh, sort of really developing even after a, a mild winter. I, I think that's very interesting when we think about how our systems develop and we have to time certain things. Now, now the National Phenology Network, right? Another sort of, a, you know, observational data, citizen science stuff, people taking data like this is saying, you know, we're really leaping out uh, well ahead of normal. Spring looks like it's close to 15 to 20 days early in some parts of the Northeast, which I find really interesting. It's sort of two ways of looking at it. how are the plants responding and what is the data from a heat accumulation perspective uh, telling us. Now, looking at soils, you know, I did this yesterday. We're, we're sort of into the 50s in the New York City metro area, still in the 40s north, but this is going to change pretty rapidly. It's been wet to the west and dry to the east, which means in the east, the soils are really going to start warming because we are pretty locked in now based on our climate center predictions for the next couple of weeks into a reliably above normal, sometimes 10 to 12 degrees above normal, and a reliably dry period as a high pressure uh, front sits over us and locks in. And, and again, we talk about how this happens as a signal of climate change because as the gradient changes from the cool to the warmth of the of the middle, right? The poles used to be really cold and there was a nice gradient all the way down to the middle of the earth. And now that gradient has changed and it gets these patterns locked. And the atmospheric river out west is of course uh, another example of that. Now, when it gets to a weed conversation, we think have been thinking about this in a number of ways because obviously the flowering component has a, a big issue from a risk perspective because we got a lot of people in our industry professionals regularly applying materials into the uh regularly applying materials into the landscape so we're trying to pay more attention to this carl's going to be maybe doing some risk models on when these things are flowering when the risk is greatest ways of minimizing that risk if you're going to put uh, an herbicide out uh and aaron we've been using the one developed prior to your arrival which is quite a quite a number of years back when zach and clark we're looking at this growing degree A model for treating it in the spring. We've sort of adopted it as a good trigger point uh, for people, but you can see in the coming week, uh, we're still not that far along uh, based on this model. We're still, it's bare. The ideal time for both the amine and the ester, which typically gets used earlier, is still barely in the southern part of the region. So there's, it could likely change quickly as we get warmer. Uh, this could start coming, but at least not for another week will we be anywhere near this application. All right, so we're talking about, one of the things we're talking about is weeds uh, in athletic fields, which is its own particular talents, particularly in school districts, Aaron, where, you know, you don't have herbicides. But before we get to that, big congrats on becoming a fellow, right? Uh, as a, you know, I, I know you've been a weed scientist. Uh, for a long time, uh, but getting a fellow in the Agronomy Society, congratulations on that. That happened in 2021. But I, I also wanted to call out, I was looking at your faculty page and you list a couple of the things you're working on. And one of them is low input turf. And one of your focal points here and the third thing, and I thought my colleague, Dr. Scamenta here would appreciate this comment that you called it urban grassland. Right. This is a term we are using more frequently. And, I, you know, I want to get it on the air here that it's somebody other than us calling it urban grasslands. Uh, was there any particular reason uh, why you've adopted that? Because obviously, when you look at turf in the Molesi paper, you only find it primarily in urban areas. So I don't know why we're afraid to call it this. Turf now means synthetic stuff to people. Let me get your comments on urban grasslands before we move forward. Well, yeah, so there's a, there's a couple 
a couple of ways we can go in that conversation. So from from an urban grassland standpoint, I guess I adopted that term, you know, several years ago because um, mainly, I guess, because of the biases of some people against turf grasses. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to help, I guess, to help them understand, you know, that, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're just studying grasslands used in urban areas, you know, and so uh, to, uh, we all know there's a lot of benefits to manage turf grass systems. And you know, if we do some things wrong, there can be some some uh, some harm that can come to the environment. But when we're doing things the, correctly, the way we recommend, and so on, there's a lot of benefits uh, brought to these uh, urban communities, and so Great. on. So I just wanted to Great. kind of highlight that with that terminology. Perfect. Perfect. And, Great. And yes, the term turf has been hijacked. And, That's right. Uh, that happened to me just uh, you know just uh, a few weeks ago when I was taking a ride from the uh, car dealership who was working on my car to campus and I was in a conversation with somebody and it wasn't until nine minutes in the conversation that I realized that they thought I studied plastic fibers <laughs> you know and so no I studied growing plants real plants you know and so we talked a little bit about that uh, terminology but yeah all right great well listen um, I also want to give you a big shout out for your leadership on that original written publication that now is resourced by the Wisconsin guys here. Just a shout out to everybody. And this includes, I think Jenny Gowniffen got involved. It includes products for New York and the qualifications uh, for New York. So this is a, a great resource for our folks when they're uh, uh, thinking about applying and deciding. Now you click on weeds and you pick your weed and you can determine uh, what you wanna do for control. And Aaron, I wanna start our conversation for the next 10 minutes or so on uh, annual bluegrass poet trivialis and what was it? Poa palustris foul bluegrass. How long were you stumped before you came to the, the identification of foul bluegrass? Just two minutes. How long did it take you to figure it out? Uh, it probably took, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe a day or so of looking at some different samples. Um, you know, what we'll see sometimes, and you probably see this even, uh, you know, in New York is, right, you'll find grasses that don't typically grow in our area, but maybe they came in from seed from Oregon or Washington or somewhere else. And that's how uh, these grasses that we rarely see maybe pop up from time to time. Or sometimes it's more of a woodland species that particularly in early spring when they're, when, you know, the trees haven't leafed out yet, uh, then we, we see these plants growing on a lawn. So, yeah, lots of different poa species out there. We normally just deal with a handful of them. Um, but yeah, that was one that I was seeing a lot last spring. Well, one of the things that has been happening more and more, you know, if we want people to have natural grass surfaces and maybe having asynthetic surfaces, but more natural grass surfaces, and they want some high performance on it, which more and more schools are going to want, and they're going to start hiring really good sports turf managers that are going to roll fields and test fields and do things right. Um, they're going to want to use uh, herbicides in some cases. Now on K through 12, they're not going to be able to do this uh, without an exception, but we have a lot of people who manage sports fields outside of that who listen and watch. And obviously uh, I want to talk a little bit about your work with mesotrione and amicarbazone. Is, is that uh, exonerate? Correct. That is exonerate. Okay. So you were involved with Matt uh, in publishing this thing. So this particular paper are, are, you know, mesotrione, I understand a little bit, you can use it seeding, but overall is one of the challenges. This is really what I want to chat with you about. Let's start with annual bluegrass. Is it reasonable to have both a herbicide program for annual bluegrass on sports fields and an overseeding program that we know we often need routinely on heavily used fields. So I'm basically asking, how do you put together a, an effective herbicide program balancing with an overseeding program in a cool season market? Yeah, well, as you know, anytime we develop a program to control annual bluegrass, it gets extremely complex very quickly right. uh, because right. there's so many factors at play. So if we wanted to develop a program where we wanted to seed and be able to use herbicides, then uh, we really have to first start with, you know, what dates were we planning on seeding, right? Were we just planning on doing a fall seeding um, uh, or were we planning on doing a spring seeding? Is our seeding a dormant seeding, which really isn't coming up to the spring, you know? And so we really have to start to think about what seeding dates 
based on your sport and the use of those fields and when you can actually get out there and, and be able to seed those areas, what are those dates going to be? And then from that, then we could build herbicide programs around those application dates because some of these products are going to be fall products. Some are going to be uh, more spring products uh, just based on what time of year they typically work best. And so I would start with the seeding because it's we need grass on our athletic fields, right? So we're going to start there. And then from there, let's develop a herbicide program that's not going to then harm those new seedlings or the existing uh, grasses that we have growing there. So, so then that would preclude any routine overseeding, right? In some cases, some people will do that routine overseeding uh, of the high wear areas. We've had a lot of uptake of that particular strategy here in the Northeast, particularly getting ryegrass into high traffic areas, really high rates on a routine basis. So that would preclude it. But is mesotrione a viable product to use through that process? Obviously, it's going to allow some germination and give some post control and a little bit of pre. I know it's not everybody's favorite, but it has that. And maybe the same is true with Pilex. Uh, are they interchangeable that way, uh, Aaron? Let, let's talk about using herbicides that we can actually keep seeding with. Yeah. So one thing I'll I'll mention because you as you've already said, right, we're, we're pretty site specific with these athletic fields, but we're coming in and seeding these high wear areas. Yeah. So like for football, obviously that's going to be between the hashes for soccer. That's going to be in front of the goal mouse. So there's no reason we can't develop a, a herbicide program um, for the areas we're not overseeding. If like in soccer, the areas that we're routinely seeding is a very tiny part of the field. So we have to keep that in mind also. Um, Pilex and Tenacity are very different on Poa annua. The, the Pilex is not really going to provide any annual bluegrass control, okay. um, whereas the Tenacity can, but the, the, the control is somewhat inconsistent. Mm -hmm. So, but we do know that Tenacity is a very useful herbicide to use um, at the time of seeding to keep those weeds from coming up and competing with that new grass seed we just put out. So absolutely, I think Tenacity would be something you might use on athletic fields when you're seeding and when you know that there's going to be some weed germination, you know, the next two or three weeks following that seeding based on the time of year. Uh, and it may or may not provide annual bluegrass control based on the, the time of year. So It's very interesting. I was just out in the Pacific Northwest, uh, Aaron, and they're starting to use Cethoxidem for selective ryegrass control in POA annual. <laughs> yeah, I, I use that on my research farm to uh, kill exactly. bentgrass in my POA bentgrass uh, putting green, you know, so. That's exactly right. Yeah, so Cethoxidem uh, can be used very, all the um, the group one herbicides. So Claim Extra, yeah. uh, Cethoxidem, which is segment, um, and uh, one uh, Fusillade. Uh, uh, is, is that is, is and what about manuscript? Is that fusillade? Is no manuscript is a different AI, same mode of action. I have not tried that on Poa Annua, but uh, like, uh, but that one is uh, actually uh, just this year is getting some Poa Annua added to the label because the European labels with that ingredient have had uh, fine fescue and annual bluegrass uh, previously, and so now Syngenta on their U.S. manuscript product are, are adding. Uh, annual bluegrass and fine fescue to that label. Well, you know, this is a real niche conversation, right? I mean, there's a lot of weeds that we worry about, but but this is pretty much, I, I think, really the, the toughest one. And one of the problems with it is with its shallow rooted nature, uh, it tends to not provide good rooting if it's in, an, in a bluegrass field of some sort, yeah. both poa triv and, and annual bluegrass. And so far, we, you know, we've had this problem on our Division One soccer field here at Cornell, uh, and it's expanded dramatically, but we have not seen any increased dividend yet uh, associated with it. So listen, I want to change gears because I actually reviewed this paper when you submitted it uh, with uh, Ross. And are you having withdrawals now that Ross is gone? This guy has been a factory. Love yeah, this kid. I'm, yeah, I'm still having Ross withdrawals. Yeah. I mean, imagine. So yeah. you did a real, this is about to happen in our turf grass stands, Aaron. I was very interested in this. Now, you know, I don't, I, I think we, I got to be careful, right? We, the scalping word always makes me a little uneasy because of the history of that. And I actually brought that up in the review of the paper that maybe we should find a different word and maybe we will at some point. But I think everybody knows what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is historically in the Northeast, and I'm apparently out in, in, in uh, where you are too, 
Ryegrass will begin to produce a flowering stalk that lingers and it'll do it under traditional mowing heights. Um, I'm not entirely sure I know exactly the environmental conditions under which it does it. You're probably gonna inform me a little bit on that, but it is a persistent problem, particularly with ryegrass. If you get dry at a certain time, it will literally sit there for six, eight weeks uh, and, and, and give this brown haze appearance this stemmy ratty appearance uh, to the turf grass stand. Now, I read this paper and I was thinking about what kind of a graph am I gonna show? And I figured I'm not gonna show any of those graphs because they're very noisy graphs. It took me a long time to review this. So I wanna see if you can give it to me in a very slow elevator ride uh, summary of, if you have this ryegrass stemminess problem historically in your turf situation, is there a fertilizer and close mowing or scalping program that will reduce this in your ryegrass stand? Yeah, so, so just in general, most plants that when they flower, they're going to, uh, temperature is a factor on when they flower, the length of the day is a factor, and then for some plants, also what we call vernalization, basically have they have received a cold treatment in previous months is also a factor. So ryegrass is gonna flower in uh, early summer because it's received cold over the winter, the temperatures are just right for flowering and the day length is just right for flowering. And, and that's very predictable from one year to the next. Mm -hmm. And so that those flowers are what you're talking about, the seed heads, the brown stalks that we see there. That's the stalk that once held that flower up in the air. So we do know that if we uh, give the turf a little more fertilizer, and while we didn't study this, I would add that if we irrigate the turf, that will help with the decomposition of those stalks. And that's what I think it is, a decomposition of those stalks more rapidly. It's not that the plant's forming less of them. It's that with that added water and fertility, then the microbes can break those stalks down a little bit faster and they'll disappear from our turf. Plus, that's helping the, the turf density, which, which may also kind of mask uh, some of those. Uh, now, from a scalping standpoint, what we essentially found is that if we mow the turf just a little bit lower, uh, when we know that seed head is about to come, then essentially what we can do is cut off or remove a lot of those seed heads before they've, uh, they've, they've emerged. And uh, then uh, while we're dealing with a little bit of a short-term uh, you know, scalping, although again, our turf still looked green after we scalped it, we still had good verdure. Okay. And we didn't have as many seed heads afterwards. And this just kind of came about accidental, you know, out at the research center, mowing some things. Mm -hmm. And uh, this observation by Ross that where he had mown some, some grass a little bit shorter for some other purpose, that now all of a sudden we weren't seeing as many seed heads later on. And that's what led to the... the so the so let's define this scalping thing a little bit. Um, it stayed green. So you're, you essentially violated the one third rule. And uh, at least based on some of Bill's work and Carl's exploration of how animals eat grass, that when you violate that one third rule a little bit, you get a surge uh, of growth uh, on the other side. Is that part of it too, Aaron, that when you, how much did you cut below the one third, if you could remember? And then, and then did you notice, because I know you've had a whole series of papers where you've, you know, looked at the carbon nitrogen fluxes out of mowing and things like that. So um, did you notice a big surge in growth when the ryegrass was, was cut back like that? Yeah, I would not say that we noticed a big surge of growth, but we also weren't, you know, looking for that or we weren't mm -hmm. collect, you know, collecting a mass. Um, as far as the heights we used, and this is all my memory, so but I think it should be pretty close. I think we were mowing this area at about a three inch mowing height, which means based on the one third rule, when it gets four and a half inches tall, I mow it back down to three inches, um, uh, excuse me, four inches tall. When it gets four inches tall, I'm mowing it back down to three inches. But what we would do is take it from three inches down to an inch and a half. Okay. Okay. So not enough that we're going too, too low to the ground to permanently damage the plant. Uh, but certainly we're removing, uh, you know, a whole lot more than what we would normally remove. And that was just enough to, to help nip off some of these seed heads that had not emerged out of the leaf sheath yet. So. so that worked, but timing mattered? Timing absolutely mattered. Uh, and But what was nice about this is because this particular grass uh, seems to be more, most focused on day length from a flowering standpoint, assuming 
the temperatures are right and it's been vernalized, then you could kind of time this. And we, we were able to find that from uh, consecutive years and two different sites that we could predictably uh, pinpoint when that was. Okay. All right. Now, listen, we're past the, the 30 minute mark, Carl, but, and I, I had even more to chat about because this guy is prolific. Forget it. Uh, but I want to hear, uh, are there questions or do you have any questions? Because there's a lot more about this particular thing that we could learn from the value of just a rejuvenating low mow every year on every lawn uh, to sort of stimulate it uh, and looking at timing. So, Carl, what about questions? Any questions? Yeah, I just want to go a couple comments. So Ben Polymer said he's used mesotrione uh, with decent results. He just needs multiple applications and sufficient water. So that's maybe something uh, to consider if you're using that. Um, Greg Jorvis was asking about the type of, of rolling, how big it is. Uh, so that paper was, I think 2000 pounds was the entire roller. It was a lightweight roller. I don't think they filled it with water, right? You can buy the ones where you fill with water. So that was pretty lightweight, I think in comparison to some other things. Um, uh, let's see, Gary was asking, I think he's looking for more POA, POA control. I'm not sure, but he was asking if you can combine tenacity with certainty. Um, I don't know if you guys... Certainty is certainty still labeled in New York? I don't think it is anymore. I don't know if it's, I don't know if certainty is labeled in New York. I thought yeah. they pulled it. It might not be. Uh, I thought they pulled it. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't so, know if you have more POA control there or not. But uh, yeah. What's your oh. favorite post POA control in a lawn height turf, Aaron? Um, I would say I really don't recommend one much for, for lawns. Uh, quite honestly, I'm, I'm trying to get people to focus on typically getting a homeowner to change some kind of behavior, whether the homeowner's mowing too short or they're watering too much. I'm trying to get them to change those things because as mentioned, some of these products like uh, Tenacity, I got to be out there applying it every 10 to 14 days. And that just uh, doesn't work for a, uh, uh, for a lawn care company. And the cost of these products is, uh, is typically much more than a typical herbicide that, uh, that might be used in, in a lawn. And, and so I don't want to put uh, you know, those lawn care companies at economic risk to go out there and put all these expensive applications out when I know that the homeowner really probably won't be satisfied with the results because a lot of these products maybe provide 30 or 40 percent POA control and not the 100 percent that the homeowner might be expecting. Okay, Aaron. Thanks so much for taking the time. I really appreciate it. I, I just, I know you're busy. Are you you're still, you're an administrator now, right? Uh, no, I stopped doing that a while back. I did that for a short time, but uh, back to doing uh, turf full time. So. Uh, good. We're very glad to have you. That would have been, it uh, would have been very sad if we lost you to administration. So we're glad to have you back. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, Thanks I for joining turf, us. So thank you very much for the invite. Thank you. All right, Carl. Thanks, everyone. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be back again next week, Thursday, with the golf show. And uh, we'll let you guys know. We'll try and get, let you guys know guests uh, when we can. But, you know, it's always uh, a little tough uh, these days to get some, some people secure. So yeah, everybody's busy. For coming on. Everybody's busy. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll see everybody next week. Take Thanks, care. Carl. See you, Aaron. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.